Welcome, everybody. This is your Nature Journal Workshop, um, our conservation uh, edition with special guests. This is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to wait a moment longer for uh, people who are just adding in to the, the meeting. And it looks like looks like we now have a full house. Um, Veda, thank you for uh, taking care of things behind the scenes. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be with you today. This is a special edition of the Nature Journal Workshop, our conservation and art program, um, which we do with uh, Marsha Sivak of Be Provided Conservation Radio. She has a wonderful podcast that helps uh, conservation-minded folks be able to, to keep up to date with developments in conservation and to meet people who are around the globe are doing important conservation work. I've asked her to, uh, she has, uh, the one who actually introduced me to our special guest, we've asked her to come on. She's going to share a little bit of um, pre-recorded material. Also, we'll give you a sense of her podcast and uh, want to encourage people to also subscribe to that and check it out. And, um, and then she will be introducing our next, uh, our, our primary guest for today. At, um, after we learn a little bit about canid conservation, I'm going to be returning and be showing you a few tricks and ideas to help you with the proportions of wild canids. It's gonna be a great show. And Marsha, I'm delighted to have you on. I've listened to a bunch of your podcasts and um, really appreciate what you do to um, help shine a spotlight on important conservation work going on around the world. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Marsha Ziva. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate these. I, I love these events and I really appreciate you taking the time and 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 to share this with your community and i also thank your community as well for welcoming this information as well and um i'm happy to introduce you to all the people i talk to it's a lot of fun so i do a podcast as john mentioned and i share stories of people working with the you know animals and wildlife or the environment and I have a little uh, two and a half or three minute audio um, of an interview I did with Camilla Fox, and she's the founder of Project Coyote, and she also works with our guest today, Michelle. So I thought I'd give her a little introduction and also shares a little bit about um, the challenges coyotes and, and carnivores and canids are facing and, and why we need to protect them and to love them. So. Um, is there a way I can share my screen, John, to get to my website? Should yes. I be able to do yes. That? Um, there's a uh, uh, green share screen button at the bottom. Oh, okay. okay. And if you click on that. Uh, okay. Oh, there we go. So if I get to my website here, I don't know what, can you see? See my website at all on the screen yet? Uh, no. So uh, what's going, what you're going to see is you you will yeah oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for letting me get through this. So this is my website, and I'm going to scroll down here, and this is my interview with Camilla, and I'm just going to play the first few minutes, so you get a feel of what my podcast is, and you'll also get to hear some beautiful songs of Coyote in the beginning. So. Thank you for allowing me to do this. Hopefully it goes. Historically, the coyote features prominently in Native American mythology and folklore. In some stories, the coyote is a sacred being with creative powers. In other stories, the coyote is wily, deceptive, and a trickster, but almost always referred to as creative and intelligent. I am Marcia Civic, and this is Be Provided Conservation Radio. Thank you. 
These were the sounds of coyotes communicating and audio provided by Gina Farr. These sounds may be more common since the pandemic and we have all slowed down and had to shelter in place. Many people report observing these animals in places they had never expected. This is true for coyote sightings. Coyotes are highly adaptable to new environments. They are likely the first wild carnivore one will see. The coyote's adaption to new environments are good for the coyote in one way, but in another way, it brings them close to people, specifically people's pets and livestock. This has caused fear and anger for coyotes when they are living so close to us. This is why animals such as coyotes, wolves, bobcats, and bears are not revered as sacred, intelligent, or creative. They are sadly considered varmints in some states. A varmint is defined as a troublesome wild animal, a pest to be rid of. Many of these species really have no protections whatsoever with our state wildlife agencies and federal agencies. They often have a classification of non-game or predator or fur bearer, even varmint in some states. And what that translates to is that many of them can be killed 24 seven in unlimited numbers with almost any method imaginable. And that includes trapping, snaring, poisoning, bounties, killing contests. And most people have no idea that these practices are legal and really how many animals are being killed in this way. This is Camilla Fox, founder of Project Coyote. She has been an animal lover as far back as she can remember. Her love of animals even prompted her to become a vegetarian at the age of six. Okay, so thank you. I just wanted to share that and uh, kind of kind of show the the problems or challenges we're facing with with carnivores in our country. So, but I'm happy today to introduce Michelle Loot, and she will be uh, talking more about coyotes and wolves. And she's the national carnivore manager, correct, with Project Coyote. And she works with Camilla Fox, who you just heard. So welcome, Michelle, thank you. You're mute, yep. Can't do it. There we go. Okay. I think because I'm uh, still a participant, it wasn't letting me do it myself. Sorry about that. That's okay. And thank you for the introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. So, um, I'm gonna <laughs> deal with the Zoom and try and share my screen. I think we have to make you a co-host for you to be able to share your screen. I'm, I'm sorry, Michelle, that was my bad. I thought that uh, I had already done that. Um, <laughs> we'll get you uh, um, on as a co-host here in just a moment. So I'll just, um, I'll jump in. So National Carnivore Conservation Manager is my title. It's, it's quite a, a mouthful. Um, and I work for Project Coyote and we're based in California, but we work nationally uh, across uh, the U.S. to protect lots of different species. Coyotes are our, our namesake, but we work um, to protect wolves, grizzly bears, black bears, bobcats, mountain lions, all kinds of wildlife, uh, native carnivores across the U.S. Um, we don't focus just on imperiled or uh, endangered species, but we work on species that are considered common but are often maligned because uh, they deserve protections too. Uh, all wildlife have value, and so we work to, to protect those values. Uh, across the country. I will try and now share. Now should be able to share. Okay, great. Um, okay, how's that look? Can you see this screen? Yep, and if you, I think if you hit play, then it will go to full screen mode. Okay. And you'll be good. Perfect, okay, great. So today I wanna talk to folks just for, you know, about 10 minutes or so about our work on coexisting with uh, large carnivores, in particular wolves and coyotes, because those are some of the biggest challenges that we face. Uh, and we'll talk about calls to action and things that you can do to get involved uh, to help these particular species. So whenever I start talking about coexistence, I have to talk about you know, what is coexistence? Uh, why do we talk about needing to coexist? Uh, there's lots of challenges, uh, particularly in the modern era that we call the Anthropocene, meaning the human dominated era. 
um, where uh, the world is thought to be hot, hungry, and crowded is often a, a phrase that's used. So uh, it's warming because of, of climate change and disruption. Um, it's uh, populated by almost 8 billion people. So um, food systems are in stress and we have to meet the needs of lots of people across the world. Um, so the world is hungry in a lot of ways and it's hungry for solutions and it's crowded. Uh, and we have to share this space with lots of wildlife that are used to having space, particularly large carnivores uh, need large territories, uh, lots of large uh, mammals need bigger space. So we can't necessarily say that national parks or protected areas are the only places where conservation exists. We're now meeting these challenges in our backyards and we have to share space with, with wild um, carnivores across the country. So. This is sort of the big global context I always like to, to start so that we're thinking in that big picture. Um, and then think about, okay, what is coexistence? How does it operationalize? How does it uh, manifest on the ground? Uh, and when we talk about coexistence, a lot of people use that word and sometimes people mean different things. So I always like to start with some definitions about uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about coexistence. So my executive director, Camilla Fox, you just heard her voice earlier. Um, she and some colleagues came up with a good working definition of coexistence um, in which it's defined as a mutually beneficial living arrangement that meets the vital needs of humans and large carnivores. That's a great kind of starting definition. Uh, some of my academic friends have also worked on a definition um, where coexistence is defined as a dynamic but sustainable state in which humans and wildlife co-adapt to living in shared spaces. So you're, you're seeing maybe some, some interesting and, and common themes among these definitions. Uh, there's the um, presumption that it's shared landscapes. So it's not just wolves exist in Yellowstone and not um, in um, my backyard or in places near cows. It really is that there's lots of spatial overlap between people and wildlife. Most people uh, are starting to think that's what coexistence means. There's also this interesting uh, thought about co-adaptation or meeting the vital needs of both people and wildlife. So co-adaptation can be thought of as a sort of two-way arrow where we're adapting to wildlife and their presence and wildlife are adapting to us. And I'll talk about some specifics later on um, with wolves and coyotes. So when we talk about coexistence, it's often offered as a solution to a problem. And the problem is conflict. And conflict can uh, manifest in a number of different ways. Usually when we talk about human wildlife conflict, we're thinking of a picture like this, a black bear raiding a garbage can. This is not a you know, behavior that we wanna see. It's not healthy for the bear. Uh, it's not comfortable for people um, that live in these areas. And so um, that's often what people think about when we talk about conflict. And that happens, but um, really the, one of the, the biggest things that get in the way of making decisions and creating legislation and good policies and practices to promote coexistence is another kind of conflict. And that's conflict between human groups that have different perceptions, different values, different ideas about how we, um, manage wildlife or how we conserve wildlife. So this us versus them dynamic often comes to play. And so a huge part of coexistence and addressing potential conflict is addressing the conflict between human groups. So this is a large part of what we do is trying to bring people together um, to build trust, to collaborate and create a safe space where everybody's voices can be heard and we can move forward. And the challenge is uh, still understanding how does this, how does coexistence happen on the ground? So this coyote were walking in an urban area. Some people would, would relish the site and find that an awesome opportunity. And some people would be nervous. Uh, there are myths um, that are very prevalent, particularly around coyotes, that if you see them during the day, they're sick or aggressive, when really this is, this is normal behavior. So one of the things that we do uh, when we're promoting coexistence is just to address basic education about what's normal coyote behavior um, and what's, what's not and what needs uh, addressing. So that's, that's a big challenge. Um, so as I mentioned, I wanted to talk about a couple 
uh, specific examples walking you through coyotes and wolves and how we may or may not be coexisting with them. Uh, this, this graphic is taken from an academic paper I published where we, we identified three case studies and asked some questions about coexistence. Are we sharing space? Are we sharing land with these animals? Uh, is there co-adaptation in terms of, uh, are they adapting to us? Are we adapting to them? And is it advanced? Ad you know, is it an advantage for everybody? Sometimes adaptations um, on, the, on the wildlife side are, are not necessarily uh, advantageous for them. So wolves have adapted to, to living near cows, um, but that sometimes gets them killed. So um, co-adaptation can be um, positive or negative in some ways. So I won't talk about grizzly bears today. Uh, I just wanted to pull up this graphic to kind of show you um, you know, coyotes are found across North America and wolves are in uh, just this gray area. And I'll show you more maps in a minute. So are we sharing space with Mexican gray wolves in particular um, was the case study that I explored here. Uh, and here's a map of North America with the, an overlay of, of their historic and current ranges. And I'll just zoom in so you can see this better. So the blue oval is their historic range um, estimated. And what you're seeing in a green is the entire experimental population area. So this is the area that decision makers have decided uh, is appropriate for reintroducing wolves. But wolves don't even exist in that full green area. They actually only exist mostly in that red and somewhat in that orange area. So when you compare that red and orange area uh, to the greater blue area, you'd see it's, it's pretty limited. So they're in a minor fraction of their historic range. And that's the case also for uh, the larger gray wolf population. So I should back up and say uh, lobos or Mexican gray wolves are a subspecies of uh, gray wolves, which were originally found across uh, North America as well. So uh, whether we're talking about gray wolves or their subspecies, Mexican gray wolves, both are only in a fraction, not more than 15% of their historic range. So when we ask these questions about, um, are we sharing uh, space? We can say, well, a little bit um, in this area that Mexican gray wolves exist, there are also cows, it's mostly national forest. Uh, so they're sharing space with ranchers who are grazing on public lands. Uh, and this is where the conflict particularly comes with uh, lots of wolves, but in particularly in lobos. So we have lots of tools to adapt to uh, cows and people and wolves overlapping, uh, but they're not necessarily used predominantly just yet. So we've got ancient tools like uh, range riders, which are basically modern shepherds, or fences. Fences have been around for a long time. And we can use those to promote coexistence so that we allow wolves and cows or sheep to exist in the same places. Um, but there's lots of barriers to implementing those tools. So yes, we're sharing a little bit of space, but it's only a fraction. And uh, we have challenges among certain stakeholders in, in increasing tolerance and acceptance of the presence of wolves and an adaptation to use new tools to allow them to, to be near us. So big challenges there. Um, but in contrast, thinking about another wild canid um, that has some similarities to wolves, um, do we share space with, with coyotes? Uh, here's a map showing the range expansion that's happening in the last uh, 100, 200 years of coyotes across North America from their um, original range in the Southwest and Intermountain West. And it should also be noted that coyotes have probably contracted and expanded their ranges a number of times. And so that's why we talk about uh, coyotes being America's song dog. They really are the sort of original canid um, that is, is very American, very North American in its uh, origin. So you'll see um, coyotes are everywhere now. Uh, they're in major cities from New York to Chicago and Los Angeles. Uh, so they really are overlapping with us quite a bit. Uh, they're great at adapting to our presence. They're great at living near us without us even knowing it. So they move cryptically through spaces. Uh, they love little sheltered green spaces, even in the middle of a huge city. Um, I've watched video of coyotes uh, waiting at a stoplight in Chicago to cross the major um, the major avenue of, of Lakeshore Drive. So they're they're great. They're highly intelligent, and so they're really good at adapting to us. Uh, 
Um, and we're okay at adapting to them, but there are, are major caveats in that uh, we still trap them, poison them, um, eradicate them, or try to um, in lots of places. So plenty of people are silently coexisting without even knowing it with coyotes in their backyards and their cities, uh, but there's still major challenges. Even our federal government comes in um, and tries to eradicate coyotes using aerially gunning um, and, and all the other tools that I've mentioned, the lethal tools. And we know these don't work. Uh, so even though we have science saying really non-lethal tools are, are the best available tools to deal with any potential conflict and to allow coexistence, there's still a lot of people, even our federal government using taxpayer dollars coming in and using lethal methods that we know no longer work. Um, and they use old science to justify this. And the problem there is that, you know, science only tells us the answers to the questions that we ask. So for a long time, we weren't even asking, uh, do fences and guard dogs and um, range riders, uh, do they work in preventing conflict? And now we know because we're starting to ask those questions, but that's, that's just in the past several decades that we've really started to explore this. And now we find broad support um, that it's both effective in terms of preventing conflict and cost effective in the long run. So again, some barriers, but definitely lots of potential to coexist with coyotes. Um, so how can we move from, from conflict uh, in its current state to coexistence? How do we work with our neighbors who may not be as interested in, um, in making space for coyotes or wolves? How do we um, promote that when there's very, you know, varying degrees of, of perceptions and values for these animals on the ground? Well, that's where Project Coyote comes in. Our mission is to promote coexistence between people and wildlife uh, through three main avenues. That's education, science, and advocacy. So the science I was talking about is really important for us in justifying um, why we're arguing for non-lethal methods. Uh, so we use science. We work with scientists quite a bit. Um, to uh, provide public comment, to get involved in decision-making in all kinds of levels. We use education, so broad public education. We have a youth education program called Keeping It Wild. And this really kind of helps address perceptions and understanding of the science and unpacking of the science that says uh, we can and should coexist with, with wild nature. And of course, advocacy. So getting involved in decision-making, from county to state to national levels um, and um, just promoting coexistence wherever there's an opportunity and talking uh, to folks, good folks like you who are interested in learning more. We also have a Artists for Wild, um, Artists for Wild Nature program that I should mention. And that's another conduit. Um, so art, you know, we're gonna talk about this more today is inspiring. So you can talk about the science side and you can educate, but art also brings people to the table to talk about conservation and coexistence. So we find that a, a really important piece of the, the puzzle to promote um, conservation. As I mentioned earlier, um, we work on all kinds of species, not just coyotes. Uh, and some of the challenges are unique to each species, uh, but also um, some of the tools for coexistence really apply across the board. I mentioned range riders. So here's some of the tools. In our Ranching with Wildlife program, uh, we work with ranchers on the ground to use guard dogs, range riders, uh, fencing, uh, even fladry which I think is this next picture. So fladry is another ancient tool that we're now using for good. It was originally used in Poland and Scandinavia to, to funnel wolves, to hunt them actually. Uh, for some reason, wolves and to a certain extent, coyotes don't wanna walk under these flags. Uh, we're finding it doesn't matter that they're red, but they're often made red. Um, and they're reluctant to, to walk under these flags. So you can keep wolves away with a pretty uh, simple, fence in this, this fladry that's lightweight and can be moved around. So an old tool with a new modern adaptation has been great in, in promoting coexistence. And of course, policy. Policy is so important. So here's a picture of Richard Nixon signing the Endangered Species Act, one of our fla flagship uh, legislation that uh, Americans can be very proud about. Um, 
it's been instrumental in, in preventing the extinction of, of many species, including wolves and bald eagles. Um, and I, I put it up there and, and compare it to um, a more modern uh, situation of um, a more diverse commission meeting where, where kids showed up and gave public comment in support of coyote protections. Um, and I, I think it shows both the different levels of decision-making and also how decision-making has evolved. So uh, you'll see it's older white men mostly dominating uh, the scene uh, back in the day. And now we're seeing more and more diverse voices get involved. And that's essential for promoting coexistence and uh, moving wildlife management forward, particularly at the state level that's still been dominated by certain traditional voices um, and has, has not necessarily listened to non-hunting voices not listen to tribal voices, not listen to um, the voices of children and the considerations of future generations. So um, this sort of advocacy, this sort of lobbying, this sort of decision-making is, is really important to, to be more inclusive. And that's one of the keys, not just for environmental issues, but all kinds of, of justice issues. So environmental or social justice issues, there's a lot of, of overlap and really important to be thinking about that when we talk about wildlife conservation. So pulling back out, thinking about the global perspective um, you know, we're all in this big blue globe and we're trying to get along in this hot, hungry, crowded world uh, that we're sharing, not just with uh, various people, various humans, but all kinds of, of animals and life. And so um, everybody has a role to play and everybody can learn to coexist with wildlife. And that's where you come in uh, by getting educated on these issues, by talking to your neighbors, your family, your friends, uh, telling them what you've learned, telling them, hey, did you know we have coyotes in our backyard? And it's such a great experience to hear them sing at night. Uh, these are all opportunities to promote coexistence in day-to-day -day opportunities. Um, so I always like to end with a little bit of a very specific how-to. So if you're living in a place where coyotes are near, there's a number of things that you could be doing every day, any day, um, to help them uh, exist near you and to share space with them. And a lot of it has to do with keeping your own pets safe. So uh, keeping dogs on leashes, keeping cats indoors and pet food secured. Um, these are all ways that not only protect your, your small animals but also protect coyotes because uh, it prevents any sort of overlap. Knowing that pups, coyote pups are young between April and August and coyote behavior is gonna be a little different then is also helpful. So sometimes coyotes will engage in what you call escorting uh, and that just means they're, they're following you at a safe distance to make sure that you move away from the den that they're trying to protect. Um, some people not being familiar with coyote behavior uh, find this unnerving or worrisome, just like seeing coyotes in the day, but this is all uh, perfectly normal and does not equate to any sort of aggression or conflict. And of course, feeding, either intentionally or unintentionally by leaving unsecured food outside, super important. Most conflict that stems um, with coyotes and people are from them being habituated to human sources of food, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. So being aware of that and um, looking out for your neighbors and unsecured pet food or that sort of thing outside is, is really important. And then appreciating them from a safe distance, um, keeping them wild and wary, not getting too close and too used to you. Um, maintaining that balance is, is really important. We can do that every day. So with that, I'll, I'll end my spiel and uh, open it back up. And thank you all so much for, for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, Michelle, that was really uh, powerful to, to, to hear. <laughs> um, we're gonna be returning to uh, Michelle at the end. Um, we'll have some opportunities to ask her questions. I am really grateful for the work that you and your team are doing to, um, well, I'm gonna join you on the, hi. Um, the, uh, uh, when I have an opportunity to see a, a, a wild carnivore, um, it's, it's electric. It's for me, a, just this, a, a visceral magical feeling. Um, and the idea that 
at the same time that I'm out there like, oh, I've got my journal out and I'm making some little sketches um, that um, other places at, that people are, are shooting those same animals as um, either in a, out of a, a, a misperception of kind of what is necessary for, with our relationship with them or as sport. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the areas you're working in, in science, in education and policy, um, this is the way, way forward. And opening up conversations about how we can work together. It's, those are difficult conversations um, because there's sort of a tone, at least in the United States, of like, if I disagree with you about something, then you're my enemy. And um, thank you for, um, for doing this work. I want to share it with people when you do get to see wild carnivore, we're going to sketch them. Oh, yes, we are. And I'm going to show you some tricks. I'm going to show you some tricks too. Uh, I'm, I'm going to look at um, wild canids today and we're going to compare the coyote and we're going to kind of use that as our baseline and compare coyote with fox and coyote with wolf. And so understanding a little bit of sort of sort of gross morphological differences between them is going that will help your sketches look much more wolfy. Like so, if your wolf looks kind of foxy or your fox looks kind of coyote-y, um, we're going to find out why and we're going to do something with those. Um, but again, uh, look, we're going to be returning to uh, Michelle at the end of this show. And uh, but again, my deep gratitude and respect for the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, <clears throat> here we go. Um, I am going to share with you, there it is. Um, I have a simple show for you that is going to compare um, sort of gross anatomy of these, um, of these three carnivores, these three canids. So canids are the dogs. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to start with the Cody. The, the Cody? Uh, yes, we're going to start with the Cody's. Um, and we're going to use the coyote as sort of the sort of baseline and see how it differs from the fox and how it differs from the wolf. Right. Um, so to get us started in our sketch, you're, you're out there and you see the critter, I'm going to walk you through a kind of constructivist approach to, there are many ways to sort of initially start a drawing, um, but this is sort of more of a, a constructivist approach. And what I do, and so here's, here's kind of what we're, we're going towards. This is a, when I say constructivist, I mean, what I'm doing is sort of thinking about this coyote in terms of blocks and zones, and I'll be assembling my coyote. Sometimes when I sketch, I just do this sort of loose, kind of gesture sketch all the way uh, through the thing. Um, that is one approach to drawing, and I often do that. Um, this constructivist approach, which we're going to be looking at right here, um, it's a, um, a slightly different approach. I should also say that the thickness of the body of all of these canids is going to change dramatically from summer to winter. In summer, they all look skinny. And in the winter, they all look oof. Right, all kind of noofed out. And so most of the photographs that people take of wolves, they usually photograph them, um, they'll, they'll photograph these critters in the middle of, um, of winter because they have these big thick coats and it looks really impressive. Um, but just be aware that sort of the thickness of the bodies can change dramatically. Sometimes you look like, wow, that coyote just looks so skinny. Well, it's summertime. And um, other times um, they look just, they, they're like big and chunky. So when I'm looking at this, my eyes first brought to this sort of slope of the back. If you've drawn birds with me before, we'd have this idea of pet the bird, pet the bird. So pet the bird means that you're looking at the bird, or in this case, the coyote. Imagine your hand going down the back, down the back of the neck, and over the rump, down the back of the neck, flat over the back and over the rump. And what I do is I start, that's my first line on my piece of paper, down the back, uh, down the neck, over the back and down the rump. 
So that line, I'm going to construct the entire drawing around that pet the coyote line. So start by, you look at the coyote out there in the field, you get your hand and you physically pet the coyote. Then you're gonna put your pet the coyote line whoop, on your piece of paper. Now, what I do is I put a coyote head on the end of that. This is where I'm beginning to think a little bit about proportions. Different species, the size of the head is gonna be really, really different. So when you look, I mean, a different, um, is when you look at the, the fox, for instance, you're gonna see that the fox has relative to the body, it's got a big old head. And that's one reason why they look cute, right? But, um, so I'm putting in for this, a ball for the head and a angled rectangle for the muzzle coming out. And the eyes are going to be close to the front um, right above the um, right above the the top of the muzzle here, so you can sometimes extend that line in a little bit and get your eye location. Now I'm going to construct some this body, but before I do, I'm going to do a, one more kind of essential proportions thing, and that is I want to look at how far down from that back line is the belly and how far down from that belly line is the ground. This is going to get my body length, my body depth, I should say, my body depth to be the right depth and the leg length to be the right length. So you're looking at your critter, you've got your line at the back, you don't want this to end up like a wiener dog with really short little legs. So I'm looking at how far down off that back is my belly. How far down below that belly is the ground. Those two lines are really useful in blocking in the proportions of any critter, deer, coyote, not so useful on the walrus. Now I'm going to start to assemble the body from that spine, that line of the back. I'm going to hang these parts of the body from it. And I often will start just with the, the, the middle of the abdomen. And then you can put this in as sort of a big oval here, just to help me kind of remind me that I'm sort of thinking um, as a three-dimensional thing. I've just sort of given you a hint here that we're looking at sort of a, 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 a three-dimensional form there, rather than just dropping a box down. You can visualize that. Um, or you can also add that little sort of hint of that three-dimensionality three into your sketch. And now I'm going to draw two keystones, two keystones, one for the shoulders and one for the hips. And so what these are, are, um, let's put them in here. So these are four-sided box. So notice it's sort of got, this is angled out here. This one, this one by the hips is bigger on top, smaller towards the bottom. This one here that is angled along the side here is larger on the bottom and uh, smaller on top. And note that this bottom keystone here, I put it not flat here along this belly line, it's coming up at a slope here. You're going to see this in a bunch of critter sketches. If you get the bottom of this piece over here, this is sort of morphologically, some, in other classes we sort of talk about all the bones. Um, this is, there's a shoulder blade in here that goes to here. This is where your kind of the, the point of the shoulder is. And from there, you're coming back with your humerus and your pectoral muscles stick down a little bit below that. So think of those two zones as keystones, one pointing up, one pointing down, extra style points if you get this one at a slope. Now, here's the neck. Again, the thickness of your neck is going to depend really seasonally. Um, in wintertime, it's a nice thick neck and then it's much more air conditioned in the summertime. And now the legs. We've already got the length of our legs. And for the legs here, I'm putting in 
It's a three section zone on both of those legs. You go from a large section to a medium section to a small section. And the uh, note that the height of this joint, the wrist or the heel joint, is different in the front and the back legs. So um, I used to draw this joint in the middle of this space, but here on our canids, it is closer to the bottom. So the position of these joints are different than if you've looked at a lot of deer, then you'll tend to put this joint here in the wrist way too high. If you've looked at a lot of deer, you'll put this heel way too high. But in our canids, um, they're down towards the bottom. So that first bone section. So what you're seeing here is this is the bird's forearm. This is the bird's um, calf coming, the birds. Yes, I've been darring too many birds. Um, the the uh, coyote's uh, forearm and the, the coyote's calf. Note that the front one attaches at the bottom of this keystone. The back leg makes a big bend. So you look at the, the back leg and you've got this zig, zig, zig. The front leg is a column. Front leg is a column. By the way, if you're keeping sketch notes, um, draw yourself a little, just a little sketch note of a box with a column coming off the front and a bent spring coming off the back. Now, here are our ears and our tail. So the ears are sort of medium sized in the coyote. The tail is, uh, is a medium sized tail here, tail ending just a little bit below this point of the, the heel. So that's my coyote. And those are how I would go about constructing coyote um, on my page. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at how does this compare with, um, how does this compare with a fox? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to superimpose a fox over this coyote, and we're going to see the difference. So just take a look at it and see if there are any generalizations that you can make. You see it's got those same basic body parts, but the sizes of things have now changed. So starting at our head, our head is bigger. You have a sense of a really long muzzle and really large ears. By the way, I've enlarged this fox so it is the same size here as my coyote because I'm not looking at the size of the, coyote, of the fox, I'm, I'm now thinking about the proportions. So I've sized this up to be um, the, the same size as that coyote drawing. The fox is a much smaller animal, but here in this drawing, I've made it intentionally the same size as the coyote uh, sketch in the back so that you can sort of see proportional differences between the two. Let's look at the general body size. The body is skinnier. So it's got a much more slender body and its tail is longer. So our tail comes all the way down to the ground. And when it's running around, that tail sticks out like a little flag behind it. Boop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doop. It being a lighter critter gets skinnier legs. So the legs are, are thin, the legs are petite. Um, uh, 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 William D. Berry describes foxes as almost sort of cat-like in their delicacy. All right, so nice little delicate um, fox here. So the head of the fox is proportionately larger, the body is more slender, and um, so because we're then skinning up that body, we're going to feel that we have more space between the front and the back legs because the whole body is that, that is, that's 
That's nice and skinny, I think. Big tail. On the head here, the ears are enormous. But notice I'm basically doing the same thing here with this. Here you see your two um, keystones. Same business going on. Notice that the wrist is lower than the heel. But still, that heel is not halfway up the space between here, as you'd see if you're out looking at deer. And let's compare that with a wolf. Back to the coyote. So wolf is going the other direction. On our wolf, the body is and the neck are thicker. Now, especially you get a wolf in, um, in wintertime really, really um, thickens up. So the tail's about the same height, so it's not down at fox level. The legs, proportionate to the rest of the body, are shorter. So that means that the legs are going to be thicker, shorter legs than you get with sort of a more long-legged coyote. Big, thick neck, and the ears are proportionately smaller. So the muzzle is thicker and the ears are smaller. On some hybrid um, wolf-dog hybrids, you'll get bigger ears, more pointed ears. But on wild wolves um, that have not been crossbred with dogs, um, you're getting little sort of smaller, more compact ears. So you can think of these as a, uh, as a, as a continuum. The coyote in the middle, as you get more towards foxy, you're going to be making your body more slender and your tail bigger. Your head is really large. And as you get into the wolf, you're going to be making your body thicker, your legs a little bit shorter. And um, the ears, smaller ears down here, big ears down here. One last thing that is interesting is the pupils in the eyes of these. If you are getting close enough to see the pupils, um, you've got a really good spotting scope um, or have a cooperative um, canid. But when you are in the larger um, canids, their pupils are round. For the fox, the fox have little vertical pupils. And what's interesting, if you also look at the small cats, vertical pupils. Your house cat has vertical pupils. You get to large cats, lions, and they have round pupils. So this is the round pupil here. This is your vertical pupil down here. Uh, it doesn't really show up on my sketch. But um, should that end up in your, um, in your drawing, just kind of a fun thing to remember, that the smaller carnivores there, you've got a bunch with these vertical pupils. And the, as you get to the larger ones, you get into the rounds. There is just sort of a little bit of comparison between those different body forms. And there is a fox. And you know what to do. All right. Pat the fox. Pat the fox. Nice fox. Feel the fox. Be the fox. Pat that fox. Oh, nice fox. All right. And um, Let's make a little sketch of that. Remember to have that line to show the thickness of the body.
we're going to give this just about one more minute to block in your basic shape. Once you've got your basic shape blocked in, if you want to put in any details, you can. And there we go. So I'm now stopping my share. And um, we're going to come back together here. What I really am going to suggest that everybody out there do is to go online, do a Google search for fox, coyote, or wolf. Get some um, images of those and practice just blocking in the proportions. As you do, really look at these uh, craters to sort of see like what are, you know, here's I was catching what are the what are the sizes of those different sections that you're seeing and um, so that as we're sketching those we're paying attention to those sorts of of details um, a little bit of practice is going to help cement those proportions into your head and um, otherwise, you're out there like, like it's, it's, it's coyote, but, but, but mess with it. And just sort of see how that basic structure is going to compare between, the, um, between those three different groups. So we're not saying like, here's the carnivore formula. We're saying here's a, an approach to kind of, that can help you look at these sorts of proportions. And then we want to compare between those different species. And then your fox will look like a fox. Your coyote will look like a coyote, and your wolf like a wolf. I think that these proportions are more important than the little details. Don't get lost in like, I'm going to go hair, 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 hair. Let's work on the big kind of oof of these things. You owe me seven canids, seven canid sketches. And I want to encourage people to share those on um, uh, Nature Journal Club Facebook page if you are uh, uh, willing to. But let's crank out those. They don't, th those can be quick sketches, but you want to do seven different ones. Now, what I'd like to do is to return um, to our, our guest speakers. I'm going to bring um, both Marsha and Michelle back in here with us. And um, uh, here we go. And um, Michelle, let's. Um, Start with you. Any so uh, what? Uh, there's a number of people who are interested in. Um, so so what are things that we can do? I want to first encourage people. Two things. One is that organizations um, like Michelle's, a big part of what makes them able to do what they do is support from the uh, the community. I know a number of people often when I give a presentation make a donation to support me, and I greatly appreciate that. But today, I'm going to enter, um, going to ask if you're willing or able to make a, a contribution, consider a donation to Padre Coyote. And we'll put into the chat a, a place where you can make a donation. That makes a big difference. Membership makes a difference. Because when you become another way of, of donate, you can straight up donate, or you can become a member, and then you also get kind of updates and, and action alerts. And that's what we're going to also be talking about now. Um, what might be um, some, uh, for people who are interested in conservation of carnivores, what might be some, um, uh, uh, what are things that are going on right now that I can get involved with to help me make a difference um, for those critics? Awesome. Well, thank you for, um, thank you for that great question. Uh, so depending on the state that you're in, there's lots of state specific actions uh, and you can learn more about that if you go to projectcoyote.org. Uh, we've got lots of information up there. So first, you know, read up, get educated, um, find out about all the different issues that are happening um, with wildlife, find out what's happening in your state. Um, 
and then check out our our film so we have well it's it's national geographic filmmakers um working under the um company name comfort theory we partnered with them for a new film about wildlife killing contests so it's um it's maybe not appropriate for the youngest ages because it does show um, some imagery of what happens when people kill coyotes and bobcats. But um, if you're interested and can handle the imagery, there's also really inspiring, beautiful imagery. And that film is, is very powerful to understand uh, what's happening across this country. We've only banned it in seven, uh, soon to be hopefully eight states uh, have we banned killing contests. So learn about what's happening in your state watch that film, sign the petition. Uh, we've got a, a petition for a federal ban uh, on killing contests across public lands in the US. So please sign that petition. We've got over 60,000 signatures right now uh, stemming from that film, which is really shows you know, another form of art that, that can be inspiring and really reach people. Uh, and share that information with your family and friends on social media, let people know that this is going on. Uh, and learn more. So that's one of the biggest things. That's one of the national things. We're also working state by state in places like Oregon. Oregon has a legislation to potentially ban coyote killing contests. Uh, Virginia and Nevada are considering doing this on a, a regulatory basis through their state agency. Uh, we're awaiting the governor's signature in Maryland. So uh, fingers crossed that that's, that's gonna be our eighth state. Um, and um, number of opportunities across the states on that front. Um, wolves are also, um, that's coming up, I see in the chat a little bit, so much needs to be done to help protect wolves now that they're removed from the Endangered Species Act. Uh, unfortunately, that was a, a last minute move from the, the Trump administration. Uh, and that became effective in January of this year. And we've seen really egregious, heinous uh, attacks on wolves in, uh, Wisconsin's February hunt during their breeding season. Uh, Idaho and Montana are preparing to attack wolves um, on a, a level that's it's really never been seen um, bef you know, in the modern area, um, basically returning to trying to extirpate 90% of Idaho's wolves is legislation that's on the governor's desk right now. So in Idaho, and we're telling everybody, not even those just in Idaho, to contact, email uh, the governor and ask him to veto this bill uh, because it's just, uh, there's, there's no justification for it whatsoever. Um, there's no wildlife management benefits. Um, so lots to be done with wolves, uh, stay engaged with that. We've got state-based actions and national actions. Um, we're exploring all avenues to talk to the Department of Interior and Secretary Holland uh, to try and get wolves protected again. Uh, and that might be relisting them on the Endangered Species Act because states just cannot be trusted to manage them appropriately. Um, so, so lots of stuff and then some good things. Let's celebrate that we banned traps and poisons on public lands in New Mexico. Very proud, that's a decade in the making. So also take some time to learn about the victories and celebrate the progress that we're making and, and don't get bogged down in the sad news. Remember that it's good and it's hopeful uh, and, and we win at the end of the day. And rodenticide poisoning is uh, uh, lim or reduced now in the state of California. So that's a, yeah. that's a win for California. That's With, a win for yeah. everybody. Yeah, uh, from <laughs> raptors to coyotes and mountain yeah. lions, everybody wins with that one for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this that's is wonderful. Such, such important work. I, I am really grateful for your devotion um, mm -hmm. to this and the, the, sort of the, the informed science-based approach that you're taking to do this. And also engaging in discussion, the way that you frame this is that you know, part of part of, of, of thinking about coexistence is you know no, re, there's reducing human human conflict as well as human uh, animal conflict, mm -hmm. and um, and thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Marsha. What? Uh, um, how can people uh, stay in contact with you and the work that you're doing? And um, is there any call to action that is really motivating you right now? Um, well, yeah, yeah. So people can reach me on my website at beprovided.com. So um, I'm interested in if anybody knows anybody who's doing this kind of work. I'm I'm happy whether it's a student, artist, author to sh to talk to them and share their stories so we can keep getting the word out on this. Um, 
So, but yeah, people can sign up for my newsletter. I only, I only send out information when I send out a podcast. My next podcast is with Adrian Trevis. And that is about the wolf hunt in Wisconsin that happened in February. So he goes through um, like the state's responsibility as Michelle was talking about. Michelle works with Adrian as well. And he covers in the Great Lake region and you know Wisconsin, Michigan and such. And he talks about, um, you know, states have, even though the, the, you know, it was delisted from the federal list endangered species list or wolves were, the states have the opportunity to take action to keep the wolves on the list if they want, but many states as we're finding are, are just planning these hunts that are egregious and heinous and terrible. So, um, but he also talks about bringing gold standard science research um, to some of these non-lethal methods as well and kind of making sure that, you know, people are aware that some of these, these um, methods are, are promising and, and they work better than just going out and wiping out a whole pride or a whole, whole uh, group of wolves and, and coyotes. So, but yeah, so I'm, I'm concentrating on that for my next, for my next uh, podcast, which will be out at the end of this week or this weekend, I guess with Adrian, it, he's really interesting. It's, it'd be good to listen to if you get a chance, so. Thank you, thank you both so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so now what we're going to do is, um, this is, we're gonna sort of open up to kind of a, a community forum and, and group discussion. Um, if, if you want to either share journaling or artwork that you've done, or um, if you have, um, if, if you want to um, make a comment or, 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 or share your thoughts and ideas um, with us, um, we'll, we'll bring you into a discussion. We might have a question for Michelle or Marsha. Um, and uh, want to just remind people that our, our, our rules of, of how we engage with each other is through respect and also um, giving the other person, if you disagree with somebody else, um, we give them the benefit of the doubt. It's called the principle of charity, where you, you take their arguments and you sort of frame those in the, the, the best light, most sort of reasonable position that you can. Um, and that's a good practice for any time you're dealing with uh, uh, something with kind of conflict. Um, the... And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to take a look over at the gallery. Uh, you can either raise your hand um, um, or through the, the uh, reaction, under the reaction buttons, there's a place to raise your hand and we'll bring you into the conversation. Um, you can also um, just sort of uh, wave at the screen and we'll know that you want to engage and, and share. And um, so, um, nature journaling community, uh, we are, oh, I have to, I've now allowed, you're now able to unmute yourself. Um, does anybody have a question for our, our, our guests or a journaling moment that you wanted to share, a thought, a comment, or an idea? Let's jump over to Heidi. It's good to see you again. Oh, uh, Heidi, you're currently muted. Oh, we're still muted. Um, so, um, let's see. You, oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, we had all the uh, quite a few um, um, coyotes um, walking around uh, Pinto Lake, and um, they were also in other people's backyards, and and it was really it was really interesting um, to see that uh, because we've had. Um, we've had different animals doing that 
also. It's um, this is in Watsonville, and um, and and uh, it my my picture was pretty close, but not very good. <laughs> you know, it just. Um, I'm sure others are, are doing it, but it was so good to to hear you talk about these these animals, and I I really enjoyed it, and uh, uh, thank you. So that's that's me. <laughs> thank you so much for that, um, Michelle. So she's seeing uh, coyotes in the area um, and uh, in engaging with those. Um, are coyote populations rising um, in the in the United States? Well, a lot of coyotes are not necessarily studied very well, um, so it's hard to give um, concrete answers about numbers. Uh, they've definitely been in the last several decades expanding their range, uh, so in that way they are taking over um, more territories. Um, but there's localized contractions and expansions and changes in populations. It's really hard to note. Uh, there are often perceptions that coyote populations are rising in places, um, but that might just be people interacting with coyotes more. Um, and that can be, there's a number of different factors locally that might um, increase certain interactions or observing coyotes seasonally or uh, changes year to year that um, just increase observations and not necessarily um, populations. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. can, can Michelle, you, can you mention the movie that was done a while ago with the coyotes up in San Francisco? It's more of a positive spin on the coyote coexistence that Camilla, um, I think it's called Coexisting with Coyotes and it was based in San Francisco, but also covered Chicago and how they're, they're coming up and people are seeing them more in the bigger cities and how they're adapting. Do you know the title of it directly? I, I have to look it up. Yeah, I'll have to look Sorry. it up too. We, ha we have a lot of videos. So we, we use film and short videos quite a bit. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm not offhand. I don't know the name of yeah, it. Yeah, that was a really I'm good sure. one. I saw it at the Rio Theater with Camilla and Peter Wolf and all that, or Peter Coyote awesome. you know, gave a presentation. It was awesome. Yeah. Anyways, just wanted to mention that. <laughs> And thank you, John, for the proportion um, exercise. Yes. That was great. Uh, that, that was, that's, it's, it's, it's nice to have something where you can kind of compare those two. I'm going to bring Chris and then Valerie in on our conversation here. Um, Chris Paul, thank you for, for being with us. I uh, really enjoyed this. I hear them every night. I live up in Groveland uh, outside on the way to Yosemite. So they're part of you know, daily life, except I don't see them very often. But I wondered if you could comment on uh, what I've um, con considered a pandemic effect because more wildlife has been less timid about getting out and about, especially in the park in Yosemite, but also here. Um, I just have seen an influx as we've stayed home. It might be just because we're observing it, but I think it has changed some of their patterns. Yes, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. One, we're, we're paying more attention. We have a little bit more time and space um, to observe uh, when coyotes are moving around because we're at home more. Um, but they definitely, I mean, they're great at adapting to us. So they're definitely changing their patterns um, when cities are shut down and there's not that many cars. Um, they're using different right. avenues that are easier to move around because uh, they know there's less danger in cars or people walking with their dogs. So they're definitely quick to adapt and really smart. So um, mm. I think we're still kind of trying to study what's going on and gather data and exactly how these mm -hmm. things changed. And it'll be a while before we can make any conclusions, but um, very interesting sort of natural experiment, really. Yeah, it really is. And I, I hope that we can learn a lot from it you know, modify our behavior a little bit more. Absolutely. It's a good opportunity to, for all of us to adapt and learn. Right, right. I really enjoyed um, everything you said. I just wrote and wrote and wrote sketch notes. And I especially liked doing the proportions because I, I really struggle. And when you put one, one on top of the other, that was fun. It really brought it home. <laughs> that was useful. Thank this you. was really fun. Thank you so much, Chris. It's really good to Thank see you. you. Um, 
So I'm now going to also bring in Valerie here. Um, uh, Valerie Dearborn, um, you can unmute yourself and um, um, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I just have a little anecdotal story. I was out, I live in Lake Tahoe and I decided to go out for a late afternoon walk this past week. Um, and I was going up a busy boulevard, uh, ski run boulevard. And uh, up at the top of it, I decided to turn off on Needle Peak Road. And um, so I was having a nice walk and Needle Peak goes up and then back down. And when I get to the top, there is a home on the left, um, but the homes are pretty far apart and dogs were sitting in the window and they were barking wildly. And I thought they were barking at me. And then I started on the downhill side and a small sports car came racing by me and after it went past me, just honked on its horn. And I looked back thinking, why are they honking at me? Well, I was being followed by a very large coyote and I did not have my hiking <laughs> stick with me. <laughs> and, and the coyote froze in the road and I turned around and looked and there was the car and the coyote and looking right at me. And um, it was the largest coyote I've seen. I've lived out here 16 years. So just dovetailing on that whole pandemic discussion, um, I, I don't know because they have been coming out into neighborhoods for years here, mm -hmm. but usually it's very early morning. Occasionally you see one like at four o'clock in the afternoon, but usually not. Um, they're more really early in the morning. And so I was really surprised and shocked at the size of it. It was really huge. That's my story. <laughs> what month was that? That was last week. That was last week. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I wonder if that was, you, uh, Michelle was mentioning that sometimes if you are, uh, they will escort a person. I wonder if that could have been that escorting behavior. Maybe. Definitely. It's the right time of year for that to be happening. I thought he's trailing me. <laughs> it's saying, he didn't follow me home. Move along. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Move along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also something that's really exciting going on with canids is uh, wolves are now starting to come back into California. Well, yeah, um, we mentioned OR 93. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's making his way down to San Luis Obispo. <laughs> really, really exciting time. Um, Bowie, thank you so much for that story. Um, let's see, I'm gonna jump over to the gallery. Um, um, so uh, uh, Marsha and, and Michelle, I'd like to introduce you to Ray Bonto, uh, who's our friend in London, an avid uh, uh, journaler and observer. And um, Ray, good to have you with us. Hi. Ray Bonta. Right. <laughs> hi, um, hi, so um, I, I don't sketch it very much, but I just did a light thing. And, and that was the wrong. Yay. Uh, yeah, these, you know, the, this, um, I, I see you've really got the, the, the angles kind of putting in those um, keystones really sculpts the front and the back end of our, our carnivore drawings. I really like the way these are assembled. And this for my nature journal. Um, ignore that. Uh, I shared this last time, but then I get some uh, magpies. I, I have a big soft spot in my heart for magpies. I love the contrast on magpies. That's, yeah. that's really exciting. Yeah, nice perspectives. I like that. It's yeah. For quite a long, it stayed for quite a long time and then it started raining. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and magpies on toned paper, twice the fun. <laughs> yeah. 
Anything else? Actually, it was hailing. Oh! Hey, so, uh, Ray Fonto, mad points for going out in all weather to get your nature journaling on. <laughs> I mean, it was ha ha hailing or raining at the end, um, so that's why I have to leave. Uh, but then today, I did. Okay, um, this was done with an alcohol marker, but my paper is quite thick, so it's quite safe. Um, it doesn't bleed through. What is it? What? what is it? Pigeons, of course. Oh. Yeah, so. uh, this is this is really exciting observation. And then I saw no, and then the pigeons went away, and I saw a tulip. Yeah, in the garden garden. So. Uh, see. Ray Bonto, you're now understanding the way these paints work in a totally different way. Um, it's because you put in these, these brush models um, and filled journal after journal, um, you're really understanding the, the media here. We talked the last time we met about um, the, the way you're now seeing light. And I see that the, the light dancing um, through these, these petals. Same thing. I'm really excited way, about the way that you are observing and seeing and documenting. Uh, yeah, um, it was only in, uh, you might think it was only in watercolor, but actually I used a extremely, extremely hard pencil. Not mm. very hard, probably, I don't know. It <clears throat> might be below some kind of H pencil, but that's why <laughs> you mm -hmm. don't get an outline. Right. <coughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's it's really great to, to check in with your journal. I'm glad to see that uh, your your pigeon friends are still doing well. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Um, over. Uh, I'm going to jump over to Ivea. Um, thank you so much for um, helping manage the the meetings. This is our co-host. Um, Vea Moore. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you all. And I'm really inspired by your work. And so, so I had a question. I do this restoration work in the Presidio of San Francisco. It, it's good that we did this because it just jogged my memory. Last week, I did see some scat on the side of the trail. Um, looked kind of big, full of grayish fur. And there's been a lot more signs lately for coyotes um, all over the Bay Area. And so in the Presidio and then also up at um, at Corona Heights. And so I do, I go into environments like these to restore, um, like there'd be a trail here and then over on this side, I might be pulling some things up. There's our Golden Gate Bridge, or then sometimes a little bit more into the brush. Um, and so what I was wondering is that if I happen to encounter a coyote, um, what would you, because of course I'm, this is their space that I'm entering into. I'm doing work here, but it's their it's their home. So, what would you recommend I do in order to be respectful of their space and also to get out and and prevent harm from coming to either myself or the coyote? Um, in in the, and also, would you recommend wearing certain clothing too, to like I don't know, just protection or else for to keep them away? Any suggestions? That's a great question. Um, so typically coyotes are going to know, you know, whether or not you're wearing a bright color or not, they're going to know that you're moving through their space and give you the space typically. Um, uh, dens are really hard to find. So you can keep an eye out for a den, uh, but you're probably not going to find it because they don't want you to find it. Um, but if they're concerned that you're too close to the den, they might engage in that escorting behavior. Uh, they might seem nervous and be observing you a lot. And if you, if you get that sense, then uh, just move a distance away uh, and see, you know, are they still following you? Do they still seem nervous or are they staying away? And then you've probably moved far enough away from the den. Um, you're not typically going to have a, an encounter where suddenly you've both been surprised and you're super close. Uh, but if they are getting too close, uh, you can be big, bad, and loud and clap your hands and say, hey, coyote, you know, move away. Um, and that's typically all it takes. Uh, they, they realize, oh, okay, they see me. Whoa, okay, I'll move away. Um, and that's typically uh, about all you have to do uh, in most coyote encounters. And again, 
safe distance away and, and enjoy observing them as long as they're not nervous. Has there ever been an attack? I'm sorry, Yvea. Yeah. Has, has a coyote ever attacked a human? There are instances of bites here and there. Uh, again, typically when people have been feeding coyotes, uh, coyotes get habituated and then there can be interactions where coyotes are looking to people uh, to provide food and then that could lead to aggression. That happens with all animals. I've studied long-tailed macaque monkeys in uh, Southeast Asia. The same thing will happen there. Um, so really it's just about not feeding them. Um, and there's only a few uh, instances of, of aggression. They're really rare and again, probably linked to, to feeding. Uh, we always like to say champagne corks are more dangerous than coyotes. They kill, <laughs> they kill people every year. Yeah. <laughs> so. No. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that that's 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 a that's a good standard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Risk perceptions are really hard to to yeah. be accurate. You know, we're afraid yeah. of flying and not driving when driving is much more dangerous. So it's it's good to always check our perceptions and our the things that worry us with the stats. Yeah, it's the availability heuristic. You can <laughs> easily conjure up the image of the shark biting somebody, but yeah, the number of shark bite deaths is muy pequeño. Oh, exactly, yeah. Right. Um, so I want to, um, I, again, I am so grateful to, to, to both of you for coming on. Um, folks, you can follow uh, the Be Provided podcast online, beprovided.com. Um, and you can follow, uh, I want to also encourage people to consider becoming uh, members of Project Coyote or, or donating to help us, to, to, to help be able to, to, to move towards a relationship with wild carnivores that is uh, sustainable. And so the idea of coexistence and your approach to it through science, through education, and through through policy, I think is exactly what we need to be doing. And be able to open up um, civil conversation with each other about things that, you know, our fear of, of wild carnivores goes very, very deep. It's embedded in our folklore. And you know, sometimes that's um, creating a new narrative about our relationship with wildness um, can be really helpful to us to, to, to develop new policy and a, uh, and a new relationship. So thank you for, uh, for the work that you do and for sharing this story. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for all you do. Yeah. Um, folks, we are uh, really honored that you shared this time with us. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for the work that you are doing in your own communities for conservation and stewardship of this planet. I want to encourage everybody to go out and uh, get back into nature. Bring your journal with you, explore, celebrate the beauty of this world, and let that those, those moments in nature where we connect with the world be the fuel that inspires us and helps us kind of work through what are sometimes the challenging, the difficult, the hard parts of also being a steward of working towards Congress, uh, conservation. But um, if you regularly go out and water the seeds of your connection and love of nature through direct observation and journaling, um, we'll have the strength to come together to protect and preserve the planet. And also just as we have kind of come together in community here, in the Nature Journal Club, being in community with other conservationists, other nature stewards, is a really important and powerful way to make a difference. Alone, we are weak, and together, we have the strength and the wisdom um, of, our, of our collective hearts and minds. So thank you all, and we will see you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye, my friends. Bye bye. Thank you, John. <laughs>